Hi guys, welcome to the iWrite Monday edition of the podcast, um, video cast. No Nicola Sturgeon presser today, but I thought I'd give you a report anyway. She was brilliant. <laughs> she was fantastic. It was the bestest, westest press conference ever. And she was, at the, she was massive. The best performing leader in the world. That's it. And that was a press conference that she didn't have. Um, Boris Johnson's coming to Scotland. We're going to have a chat about that. Okay. Um, I think we need to keep hammering on the power grab. I don't, I'm not quite sure that people realise how serious it is. Now, we're going to have a chat about George Caravan's take on the polls. I think it's yes. him that also covers the power grab. Is it him that also refers yeah. to the power grab? Yeah. Um, so that'll... That'll segue us into George's piece in the National. Uh, Boris Johnson coming to Scotland. Are we trembling in our boots, boys? James. No fast. No fast. Dinnick in. Yeah, Dinnick in which fridge you'll be appearing in, but I'll be anywhere near it because we'll not get in. It'll be a usual Tory party only thing. Some business will open up the premises, tell me I'll probably wear a hard hat and a high vis vest and tell us yet again how important the union is to him, even though we're a verminous race that need to be crushed under his heel. And then he'll disappear back down there, having made very little impression other than on the hangers own in the Scottish media. So we're not expecting an appearance at Butte House, no? Nah, I think he's, he's been shown the back door once, he'll no do that again. No, you're right there. I, um, I was... And this morning I was listening to Audible and I was listening to a report by Simon Shama on the history of the Irish home rule situation from about just up to uh, before World War I. John Stuart Parnell and uh, Gladstone and the rows they had and all had the shenanigans. It was remarkably reminiscent of what's got, what's, what we've seen in the last couple of or three years here. Um, so what goes around comes around. I don't trust. Sorry, what what are we supposed to be talking about? Because I got carried away there. Uh, we're talking about Boris coming up. All oh, right, I forgot about him. Uh, he was on TV again this morning talking rubbish. What did he say to this morning? Oh, oh, I tell you what, he was laying down the line about schools, and schools are going back regardless. And he had a ninety-seven percent. No, no, he was doing a doing a Trump. He had a ninety-seven percent confidence rate or turning up at the schools or some rubbish? Well, the problem isn't really Boris there, is it? It's whether people yeah. trust him to keep the schools safe. I mean, we're still having, apparently, a dispute with the teachers' unions up here about um, their safety. Totally understandable. Um, I was under the impression that because they'd been included in all the discussion that the Unions were on board, but apparently not. No, no, because they're they still in the pocket of the Labour Party and are out to create grievance, if at all possible. Old Captain Mister on there, even though he's included in every meeting and every discussion, still manages to find grievance to pop in uh, the Daily Record or on the Report in Scotland when necessary. True. Well, um... So our theory on the, the Boris intervention. When, when exactly is it? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think you'll get a date, a time or a location until basically he arrives. Okay, Sometime this week. Yeah. It's oh. definitely this week, but no, other than that, we don't know. I can't see Dominic Cummings allowing his um, itinerary to be published. Do you think he'll be bringing his own fridge? Well, f funny you should say that. Uh, somebody said we should close the border to him. Um, yeah, I read that. I thought that was a fabulous idea. If we put England on the quarantine list tomorrow morning and Boris can he come, it, it's, it's just a, an act of defiance, but it would be absolutely wonderful to watch the implosion of unitic fringe as that happened. Well, well the, the suggestion was we wouldn't need to close the border. We should just scatter a free fid, a few fridges about, and I'm sure Boris could find his way into one. <laughs> Mate, if he scattered a few Tunnock's tea cakes about, he'd never be seen again. He'd be on a Tunnock's tea cake trail um, for the next few months because I'm pretty sure he loves Boyd Tunnock and Boyd Tunnock loves him. 
I'm not allowed to buy Tunnox tea cakes. Cool for no. Because I'm what just are, lining what? the unionist pockets, I'm told. <laughs> what are they? I've forgotten all about them. They no longer exist in my yeah. universe. Oh, okay. Well, I'll so, talk cheerfully. They eat, eat tonics food, mate. Let's be honest. The workers have still got to make a wage, even if their bosses are fud. So we think in the trip has got nothing to do with the population of Scotland. Do we think no. it's just to rally the troops? I think well, Tory really. troops. Oh come on! It was quite clearly a birthday present for uh, the, the first minister. <laughs> Did anybody catch the poll that was it popped up on Twitter? The Scotsman apparently has had sight of a poll where uh, support for independence has gone up a notch to 55%. Anybody can't catch see, that? Can't say as I've seen that one, mate. No. Well, I think we can say with some safety that the uh, Unionists, or at least Westminster, is panicking if they're throwing what should really be the last throw of the dice, I would have thought from their point of view, if they're bringing Boris up to, to persuade the Scots that we should, why would you, why would you think bringing an idiot north of the border would help your cause? Well, according to where I'm sitting, uh, there must be, <laughs> there's got to be a secret plan because otherwise you really are a stupid. Maybe it's an idiot's convention. I mean, George came up. Maybe there's a, a oh, secret. Galloway. Aye, maybe there's a secret sale of clown shows happening somewhere in clown shoes, sorry, happening somewhere in Scotland that we didn't Aye. check. I know who else over there. David Cobham, Nigel oh, Farage. Hmm. Well, David, I'll tell you Aye. what, guys, don't get too flippant. Let's just hope the border doesn't have to be shut while they're here. Oh, no. No, not mate. Not quarantined Aye. in. I, I know somebody that sells fridges with wheels. If that happens, we'll get Boris in a fridge with wheels and take him up to Carter Bar and then shove him to the top of the hill. <laughs> okay, a bit more serious, I think, guys. This power grab that's being uniquely ignored by, um, by our press up here, it's really serious, and I hope people are getting that message. I was interested that their line is Scotland will be getting 111 new powers returned from the EU. But yeah. nobody's pointed out it doesn't even matter what Scotland gets in the way of powers. It can all be overridden mm -hmm. by Westminster mm -hmm. with their single market idea. In other words, you can't do anything in Scotland that jeopardizes English. And I'm going to emphasize that. English markets selling so, into Scotland. Exactly. So uh, who didn't challenge Alistair Jack on this issue yesterday? How do you mean? Gordon Brewer. Oh, right. Sorry. Sorry. I, th I didn't think it was a difficult question. Um, um, uh, I mean, Alistair Jack was allowed to one lumber on, that's the word, that, blunder on, and it just uh, expressed the, the current Scottish Tory trope about, uh, oh, dear. All these, when we, this is an old one, don't forget. All these powers coming back from the EU, this has been around at least a year, maybe even longer. Well, it's been around since Brexit. Oh, when did, <laughs> I'm sorry, Nora, that was a really stupid thing to say. Wait, what's Brexit? <laughs> when, when, what's the time of Brexit then, when you said? 2016. 2016, okay, it's probably been around since then. When they promised us we would have all the control we needed over agriculture, da, 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 da. And failed to mention, yeah, and immigration. Grove, Gove is actually on record on video saying that. Well, uh, but failing to mention that Westminster intended to take powers to itself to override any decision coming out of the Scottish Parliament. Right, so it really doesn't matter what any, we already know, it doesn't matter what no. any of the, the, the main figures in this, this government, this Johnson government, say or do, but say, because we all know they lie. Now, where does that take us? Where do we go next? Well, and, until, until they do enough damage to affect people who vote for them in England, it's going to make no difference. Think about this, guys. If they do a deal with the Americans that opens up the English NHS, this legislation basically allows them to open up the Scottish NHS. Right. 
Aye, they can do exactly. They can do whatever they want. This is this, as I said yesterday, mate. This is effectively tying us into a new union, one that we have no say over whatsoever. Effectively, this legislation makes us a region of England, and our Parliament a regional council. And so a good point that Ruth Wisher brought up in her piece was they want to pump money into the red wall that just voted Tory to keep those votes. And they'll do it that at the expense of Scotland. Well, it, it, I, I think, George, I mean, uh, I didn't see this last week when Richie, Richie Sunak did his so-called budget written so well, as George Caravan put it. He says, witness the Chancellor the deliberately engineering his mini summer budget to exclude Barnet consequentials so the UK Treasury could intervene north of the border itself. Don't forget, remember, this, apparently we're only getting £21 million. Kevin Haig, the, the pet food salesman, claimed that it was, oh, no, that's not true, but uh, apparently the truth is that is the truth. Mm. Um, mm. So hence the bogus le legislation to create a UK internal market. It's this ludicrous idea, and it's just it comes with the fact that, as we've said before, they don't understand Scotland, they don't get what's going on and what's happened up here, and they take their information from the failures that represent their parties up here. So it's this idiot idea that, can what, we could maybe duel the A75 in Scotland and put a load of signs up it with Union Jacks in it. Can we used to get these wee... EU flags telling us what the EU had funded. I'd love to see them putting loads of signs with Union Jacks on buildings that they've built or stuff like that, just because it keeps the graffiti artists busy. Because any Union Jack that gets plastered over Scotland is going to last about a day before it's turned into a saltire with a pithy wee remark written underneath it. Mm. They, might put, they, put a, they might put a bit, a bit higher, of course. I don't think it'll make any difference. It'll make not a blind bit of difference, no. I mean, that, that, that will be a, a movement on its own. The other thing is that they're talking they about... sticker them. I bet they're talking about rebranding stuff and building stuff and putting the Union Jack in it. Where are they going to get the money to do this? They're broke. Oh, they'll find money to do that. Oh, they'll borrow it for somewhere, but they'll the find problem money... with borrowing it is we just point out the fact that's borrowed money and we're paying back 8.5% minimum of the entire budget that they've borrowed. And I bet you diamonds, they'll no spend 8.5% of that budget in Scotland. They'll spend about 2.5% of that here. Well, I mean, they'll simply cloak everything in a national project heading, as they did with Crossrail and the London sewerage system. Yeah, but the unfortunately, 50% of Scotland's got its own national project that has nothing to do with London Tories. Well, as I say, if they start sticking Union Jacks on everything, I would imagine the sales of saltire stickers will go through the roof. Oh, I, I, I'd like to be in that business. Mm. Well, you know how they're, um, they're, they're, we know that they're planning to divert cash that should have gone to Scotland through Holyrood, or more, more precisely the Scottish government, which they obviously in London they hate. And it should be the decisions of Scottish, at least Scottish politicians, elected politicians who decide where the money goes. Over 100 years ago, when they were discussing home rule in Ireland, they decided that they would try and take the steam out of the, the, the Rami in the west coast of Ireland by just um, legitimizing, giving loads of power to local councils. So, I mean, th th right now we're looking at a very unionist government in London thinking, right, we'll just give money direct to projects in Scotland. It's bread and circuses. People won't notice what's happening. It didn't work a hundred years ago, and it's not going to work now. Well, this Tory government especially, but any Tory government has always been willing to spend more on PR than pensions. Aye. They've always, the they've always been prepared to spend to sell their ideas to a gullible public. As long and as that's that gullible public, as long as that gullible public isn't demanding, um, for example, spending on pensions or spending on the National Health Service because they don't want universal spending. They'd far rather do it in a manner that is not seen as universal, i.e. have a road. Oh, have two roads. But you can't have a couple of hospitals because your bloody government might run them in an efficient way and make us look bad. 
well, that that's the next aspect of this. Transport. Now, the Scottish government's priorities in transport are not the same as the British government's. The British government are going to build roads, bridges, blah, 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 to get people into work. Mm -hmm. We've can got I, more of a green agenda up here. All right, right. And that'll go out the window. Can I ask uh, this old idea, <laughs> this idea about a bridge to Northern Ireland from South West uh, they'll, they'll resurrect that shite again, I know. From South West Scotland. Now, there are loads of practical issues that uh, go, you know, go against that. And there's even a, an alternative plan to go from Anglesey across to Dublin, which really would be a long bridge, but not on, Chine not on Chinese standards, to be honest, but it would be. Mm. Um, so who, who actually benefits? Uh, Denny mentioned, oh, that's another story altogether. We could talk about that tomorrow. So um, who actually benefits? You know, uh, uh, does everybody benefit? If they actually built that crossing, um, do this, uh, the Republic of Ireland presumably benefit, the people in Northern Ireland benefit, and the people of South West Scotland benefit. Is that true? Not particularly. I'd imagine that, I don't, I don't think for a second it'll get built. Let's be honest, Boris spent 56 million and didn't build a bridge over the Thames. So building a bridge over the Irish Sea is way beyond him. But if it were to be built, I don't think people would benefit at all, Stuart. I mean, fantastic for people on either side of the I'm Irish Sea that have businesses in that, but are they going to put in the billions of infrastructure required to deal with the traffic that would want to use that bridge? I would imagine that one of the planks of this plan is unionism. But that's really what I was at, why I was asking, and I'm not quite sure how that works. Unionism's well, dying in Scotland. Are they, are they trying to bring in more Irish unionists to encourage yeah. people in Lark Hall to speak out more? Yeah. Once upon a time, they sent Scottish unionists to populate Northern Ireland, remember? Do you think that hasn't occurred to them? Well, I think the, the the physical transfer of people from Northern Ireland to Scotland is beyond the ken of England at the moment. As I say, they can't bridge no. the Thames. They certainly can't bridge well, look, the Irish. Well, that allows me to, to flash back to what I said earlier on about history. Uh, at one point, about 1880, 1890, the Irish party had over 80 MPs in Westminster. And the leader of the, uh, the party, uh, John Stuart Parnell, was well respected in London and Gla Gladstone was doing a deal with him. And they looked very close to getting home rule in the sense of the same as originally that Canada had, Australia had, New Zealand had. A dominion. As a dominion. And then because foreign policy would be left in London. Of course, guess what went wrong? Apart from the fact that was a, there was a rammy between the, the Liberal Party and the, the Tory Party and the fact that Parnell ended up in, in a jail and then they had to negotiate with him in the jail. But at the end of the day, it was the Unionists in Northern Ireland who formed themselves into a military, you know, a militia, and said, we're not having it, that ended it all. I don't I, think we can learn much from 18th and, sorry, 19th and 20th century, other than the fact that Whitehall's attitudes haven't changed that much, but the world's well, changed. I'm glad you pointed that out, Jimmy. Sorry, that was a bit of a uh, The attitude of Whitehall and, and London. Uh, Aye, they still, they still believe in divide and conquer. They still mm -hmm. believe in the things that worked for them. And then, unfortunately, they didn't work, really work for them in the 20th century. They worked for them in the 18th and 19th, when they were still engaged in gunboat diplomacy around the planet. But in the 20th century, all their great ideas have created some of the world's worst hotspots. Belfast, okay. Israel, partition yeah. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering at what point the Westminster government, the Tory Westminster government, because it will be the Tories, are going to realise that trying to keep Scotland tied to the rest of the UK is detrimental to their own support base. If nearly 50% of Tories now want shot of Scotland. You're talking what, English. Yeah. What what are they gonna what are they gonna argue? 
Stay I with us. Get... We love you. No, we no. want to keep subsidizing you. No, no, At some to... point, they're going to have to get aggressive with the the Holyrood government. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's no, it's no, it's, it's not quite as simple as that. I mean, we always say they can't afford to lose Scotland because of the money, because of the revenue, and that. The reality is, no, <clears throat> the way that how London is quite so profligate. Whatever money they get for us, they just spraff up against the wall anyway. What they can afford about Scotland being independent is that we'd be a rich country. We are, we are a small population. So what would happen is automatically, in this inside a decade, the standard of living in Scotland would be markedly higher than it is in England, and particularly in the north of England. And that would cause them all kinds of problems. That's why they have to hang on to us. They can't have us improve ourselves to where we should be, given the resources that we have, because that would cause cataclysmic consequences for the English and how they see themselves in the world. I'm not sure, because I think the Tories will always put party before country. I think it will depend on how the voting public looks. I think you're quite, I would normally support you on what you've just said, Nori, but you're also forget, you're forgetting another angle about Tories. They put ideology before everything else. That's why there are the different wings of the existing Tory party. And some of them that left, don't forget, back in the, the autumn of last year, they moved out. You know, there's still it's, uh, there's still a lot of them believe entirely that, that the government government should not interfere in society and that the market should decide everything. We learned, uh, we learned, we learned this with Thatcher, remember? If we didn't, I, I I don't agree with you. I think there are still quite a lot of One Nation Tories oh, where dear. where <laughs> dogma where dogma is assumed to the One Nation idea. I do agree that this government is driven by dogma. But I still think, and especially Scottish Tories, have one nation through them like a stick of rock. Okay. Or they wouldn't be there. I mean, why would they be bothering to argue for? I'm sorry. For I thought one nation. I know. I thought one nation Tories also included uh, was actually an English thing. It's nothing to do with it. The devolved uh, uh, nations. It was about having taking into account all the the poor. And the unemployed. I thought that was Scot one Scotland, Scotland, not. Scotland. One nation tour and one nation tourism isn't about Fuck the devolved sure. nations. I didn't say it was about the devolved nations. I said it was about the Tories. The Scottish Tories have always been one nation based, benevolent dictators. That is the Scottish Tories. Well, I don't define the one nation uh, Tories like that. Anyway, we can disagree on that. <laughs> well, that's what they are. It doesn't really matter what you define them as. I mean, the, that idea that they pat you on the head for your vote and give you a stick of candy to, to get you to vote for them. I mean, that's the landed gentry are all okay, one nation all, Tories. All, all we're falling out about at this point is uh, the, the concept of one nation. One nation, I'm telling you, it used to have been nothing to do with the different nations of the United Kingdom. It was to do with covering everybody in the country, the poor and the rich. Right, Stuart, listen. Listen to what I'm about to say. Were you, were you there? This is the third attempt for me to explain to you. Oh, I'm not you talking about devolved nations in this context. I'm talking about the type of Tory. Landowning Tories. Look at the Tory party sitting at Holyrood. Look at Jack, the, the Scottish secretary. These people are landowning Tories. They're one nation Tories. What they want is a nice, quiet bunch of farm labourers digging their ditches for them. And they're prepared to go a little bit further to keep them happy Aye. and they're contented. Prepared to, prepared to spend a little bit more socially yeah. to keep the populace quiet. But that, entire, that being the entire populace of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And I would imagine it applies to an awful lot of Middle England Tories, Tories down in Cornwall, it doesn't apply to London Tories who are all driven by the market. Mm. And I'm not disagreeing apply. with you. I'm just saying that there's a lot less One Nation Tories than there used to be. And there doesn't appear to be any of them in government at the moment. Well, remember, he did, he did manage to get rid of 
10 of the leading lights by removing the whip from them and not giving it back to them so that they couldn't stand in the election last year, the likes of Justine Greening, for example. Yeah, and well, most uh, of them had the whiff of One Nation toys. Uh, well, they were kind of what we would have called Well, no, I, I, that, that's where I would disagree with you. I mean, in fact, you know, the, the English One Nation Tories are one thing, and what you describe as Scottish One Nation Tories are another thing altogether. They're unionists. Whether they're One Nation or not, I don't, don't know. Well, it's almost by, by definition. Why on earth are we about what label you park on a Tory? You, I agree. You, Can we move you on? Chuck a lump, you chuck a lumpy shite in their face. That marks them out for what they are. <laughs> uh, let's move on. Uh, George Caravan's piece in the National. Stuart, you yeah, wanted to talk about did. this. Uh, I did. Um, he cast a certain amount of extra light on the recent polls for me. Um, he analysed when the polls changed and why they were the same. You know, you go back to... Uh, you go back to autumn last year and you get to, I think it was September, October, the point at which the 21 different Tories left the party and there was chaos in the Tory party and they did a poll then. Um, they did a poll about important polls. It's about independence for Scotland, the polling. Scotland, yeah, and uh, how, I mean, it was 46, 47 percent for uh, independence against 50 something on on odd for uh, uh, for no, and then again uh, towards the end of um, January, and again the, the the polls hadn't moved much. They've only really really moved following the the coronavirus. Oh, it's not really what he said, is it? What he said was Brexit. Or Brexit appeared, well, what he's suggesting is Brexit moved the polls in favour of independence a wee bit. Yeah, well, I, I, the way I read it, 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 they drifted back again. Definitely has changed things as uh, Nicola Sturgeon and or coronavirus. So is that is that stable? Is that a really stable vote? Well, that's, a, that's the question the he's asking. I didn't read the article. I'm assuming he's telling us now that the the move in the polls isn't stable because it doesn't suit him for it to be stable. And he's going to tell us that by next, the next, next year's election, we'll not have support again. No, that's not really what he's saying. What he's saying is there were small movements, mainly due to Brexit, and he, he, he timelines the, the build-up of support um, with various things that have happened at Westminster, um, the possibility of no deal, et cetera, et cetera. He then says that it looks like the biggest boost has come from Nicola Sturgeon's high profile during coronavirus. We won't have coronavirus that high on the agenda. Therefore, can we trust that that bump for independence will remain? I think he implies, so, I think he so implies he's also we've, well. we've got, we've got, we don't forget, we've got the impact of Brexit coming next spring, early, uh, early, you know, early, late winter, early next spring. That's a factor. Uh, let me just finish with what he says. The SNP leadership is overconfident because it thinks an electoral victory will make Boris pliant. It won't, which is why the absence of any plan B is a glaring mistake. So he's, he, he's you know, there's where George Caravan's hat is. And he says, among those critical of the SNP leadership, winning a supermajority oh, via the there we system go. won't impress Boris. Have you noticed just how many bloggers this week and journalists, all coming from the One Direction, have all been using the word supermajority? You'd almost think they had a wee meeting in a cafe somewhere and decided to start pushing this idea that somehow we're going to need a supermajority. Yeah, the only, we, the only why? time we need it, the only time we need a supermajority, is when the House of Commons demands it. Oh dear, you have rewound. I mean, why do we need the permission of the House of Commons to declare independence? Daft question, Stuart. Right, Stuart, are you finally like going to admit that what you're advocating is UDI? No, I think it's something smarter than that, so I won't use the term yet. Right, okay. So why do we need... Mm, okay. So you, two point, both, so you two are both either 
Section 30 adherence that you're hanging no, up. No, don't he be, be sticking labels on me because you want to put labels on people's All right, shirt. well, what, what's the alternative? That, that, that Boris is going to change his mind? Stuart, am I standing for election? Do I have a, a list of policies that I need your approval to go for? We're part of the commentary at me. Stop pretending we're something we're not. Well, what's the matter with you there? I'm, I'm asking you a simple question. Well, it's, yeah, There's about Stuart... half a dozen different paths, and at the moment we don't know which path the SNP are going to take. But you're looking for me to declare which path I think they should take and then hang my jacket on that peg. Well, the right so now there's one big there, right now we've got one big barrier, one big wall ahead of us, which is this uh, refusal he, well, to give is the refusal to, to to permit a referendum. So, are you saying that can, we can go past that? I think there's a bit two or three, possibly four or five ways to go around that, or past it, or just break it down. However, you want to put it. Well, I'd love to hear them. I th well, Stuart. Neither Jimmy nor I, nor I suspect you, have a one-path approach to this. If Boris Johnson gets out of bed tomorrow and decides to give us a Section 30, are you going to refuse it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, wait a minute. Are you going to refuse it? Honestly, sometimes, lately in the, this last week, Nori, you sometimes really surprise me with some of the things you say. Stuart, it's stop making presumptions about what I think and listen to what's said. Well, this is what you said. You Will you refuse a Section 30 if Westminster hand it to Holyrood? It's not, my, it's not me to refuse, but even if they offered one, I think I'm sure they have a, they'd have some sort of a, something. Uh, oh, they'd have a veto, remember? Right, okay, wait a minute. Would you refuse it if it was offered? I don't no know. strings depend. attached. It would depend on the circumstances. Can you not see my sore arse? I've been sitting on this fence for the last six months, ever since this list wars came up, ever since this big row about a, a plan B. It's been longer than six months. I've been sat there right there. It's really getting sore. Well, why don't you simply admit what you really want to see? Oh, I want a revolution. Yeah, right. You want UDI. Just admit it. Well, I don't want the chaos. So how does that work? Well, you can't have it without the chaos. What do you mean you, you didn't want chaos? You want you just said you want a revolution. When's there ever been a ordered revolution? Oh, apparently there's been a velvet revolution, an orange revolution, a strawberry revolution. If you, I don't if, know. You, if you think that any of them were ordered and polite, you're a bigger ass than two bums. As I was going on to say, <laughs> I think Jimmy and I probably hold that piece of ground that says Show us a way to get independence and we'll go for it. I'd, That's it. I, if it's as easy as a Section 30, great. If it has to be barricades at the end of the day, I'm quite sure we'll be there with our wheelbarrows. Look, can we agree on one simple truth? David Cameron only agreed to the Section 30 uh, and, the Edinburgh, which, and the Edinburgh agreement that followed the agreement, uh, his, his deal with it, Alex Salmond because he was absolutely convinced that they would win, the unionists would win. Now, if we're, if we're in a different state of play, as you know now, there's a very good chance that independence could be won at a referendum, so we're not going to get an agreement. And I, I don't think, think either Jimmy and I are stupid that. enough not to think that's the case. And why you would presume we did after the weeks and weeks of chat we've had, I have no idea. I have consistently said Boris Johnson is going to say no. What I was trying to point out to you was that I'll take independence any way it's given. Any way we take it, any way we can get to the point where we can say to London, right, we are now an independent nation. Should you wish to sit down and discuss a withdrawal agreement with us, those discussions will take place at the International Court in The Hague, or they'll take place at the United Nations in New York, because you with your 300 year history of raping our country for resource and people are not to be trusted. Please come to the meeting. If not, we'll just do it anyway. I've just come, come across, just before we came on air, about uh, some trade statistics. Uh, <laughs> that'll, that'll be you finished with the discussion on how we get a referendum then, Stuart. Oh no, 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 between the UK and Ireland. In 2019, I mean, I could go through it all, but I'll post it for you. Um, 
uh, quite clearly, Ireland are doing very well, and some they got it right somewhere along the way, but they got it very wrong. I mean, to, to get born as an independent country, but God, they had a, a first of all that they had a, a revolution, and then they had a civil war, and, for, and then now we've got we've still got. Stuart, I have no died. idea what you're talking about. Could you please tell us what this is in the context of? Well, we've always got the Irish model just across the sea about getting it. Have you have you have you gobbled a priest or something over the weekend? A Why priest? have we spent half the programme talking about Ireland? It happened and Ireland's biggest issue was the fact that England owned so much land and made so much money out of the north that Ireland was never going to be allowed to be a united free nation. And frankly, they owned enough Irish politicians to make sure that that never ever happened. Right now, there's not enough money coming out of Ireland anymore. So England really doesn't care. It's just about how things look. They'd like to hang on to Ulster, but the reality is, if it becomes too much of an issue, they'll walk away and wash their hands in a heartbeat. Well, there's a, there we move on to a whole, whole new pitch in a way. That, you know, at what point do they get sick and tired of Scotland and Northern Ireland? They're not going to get sick of Wales. I, would I didn't think they way. can afford to be us. At what point do the, the English nations become a millstone? <laughs> Jimmy, is that you falling off the chair again? It was oh. something along those lines, mate. I fr fortunately, it's just a tablet and it's still working, so I can live. Oh, Jesus, suffering wet. Um, at what we point wait. does Scotland, Northern Ireland, and possibly Wales become such a millstone? round the neck of England that they want rid of us. Well, I've got to say then straight away, we have, I'm in my lifetime, we have watched Northern Ireland become such a problem that the English, uh, I, I'm sure there were polls way back in the 90s that uh, showed the English would have been happy, happy to be shot of Northern Ireland. After all, some of their boys were dying. It was in, on the news every day. People were dying in England. Seriously, you've got to remember, there were some important bombings in England, which we never suffered in Scotland. So as Scots, to some extent, we've, been, we've not been involved in that row. Again, you're wrong. There were attacks in Scotland that just weren't as high profile and are as frequent. Scotland was basically used by both sides to filter mm -hmm. arms into the north. Well, but true. there were a couple of bombing attacks in Glasgow. I can distinctly remember somebody kicking a bomb, a grenade, out of a pub, or that would have been carnage. There you go. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't deny my point, does it? But there was a long period that certainly the English were quite prepared to, to dump Northern Ireland. Uh, the people, but of course, uh, the government weren't. Okay, so remember George Caravan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we were discussing this article. So George, I think Jimmy is possibly right. George, I think, is about to nail his mass to a second independence party. That's definitely the impression I got from it. Did you did we, did you read that David Hook guy who, who apparently explained the independent? I forget. It's a bit like talking about left wing parties now, isn't it? Isn't it? Which one does he talk speak for? The independent. I independent Scotland party. ISP. I call it Walker's Mob. Oh, well, so I thought they were all women, but uh, apparently he's written a piece which has ended up published in on Wings. It quite clearly, Wings had to make sure that his disclaimer was in the bottom because from what I read about from David Hook, it didn't quite agree with what Wings wanted to, to say about the world. So we'll see. Wings has done a total vault face on this. Aye. Although he, his argument is that if there's a realistic list party, it's worth backing. Um, and up till now, there hasn't been one. He was never a great fan of Rise. You know, it, yeah. it, it looks like an out, from an outsider's point of view, when you talk about independence and the current state in Scotland, to some extent you've got wings on one side and then, and then you've got the SNP, the people who run the SNP in the other, and somewhere in the middle we've got these new list parties appearing, trying to gobble up something in between. I'm not so sure, mate. I, I, I'll look at some of the blogs and some of the bloggers and as I said yesterday, you, you take a bit for each of them. You didn't even nail your colours to any of their masts and believe that they're right. But 
I wonder if some of these bloggers, their ire towards Nicola Sturgeon and the, the people at the head of the party, I wonder if these guys know what was behind or the people that were behind the whole salmon thing. I think that's where their anger might be coming from. Because James Kelly mentioned something in a wee piece that he did, and it wasn't a big blog piece really, but he mentioned that Nicola only listens to about a, a small group of eight or ten people at the top, at a very, very top level. And I wonder if maybe four of these eight or ten people were either witnesses or involved in the case. I... The, way, the way that some of these bloggers attack her personally all the time now, it's got to be coming from somewhere, and there's a lot of anger behind it. I want, I, I'm, I'm presuming your reference to her only listening to eight or ten people at the top of the party is about party politics. I would be surprised if any leader of a party listens to more than a dozen people. I mean, there are going to be their trusted lieutenants that have been with them for a while that help put them where they are. Then they're going to be the hopefuls for the, the new generation that need to be listened to. So I, I don't think that's particularly unusual. Not yeah, but look, on, this, <laughs> on this move away from independence that all the bloggers are desperate to flag up, and as mm. I say, the fact that quite so many of them have started using the term supermajority in the same week, um, I, I wonder... You know, there's more than that, Jimmy. I mean, the, the supermajority is all very one thing. That's assuming you're going to go through uh, the coming election next year. And the, what if we ever reach that election? By the time we, we reach that election, the powers of the Scottish Parliament have been emasculated more, more than we can see at the moment on the horizon. Uh, Stuart, if, we, Stuart if, we, if we're going to get into what if we're wasting, we're, we're wasting our time even talking about politics. They could, well, Boris, 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 could, Boris, Boris could turn, Boris could turn around the morning and declare himself galactic emperor. What if he does? And I, I don't think there's going to be that much time because these, the, the fight with Holyrood and Westminster isn't going to happen till January when we come out of the EU. Mm -hmm. So there's That's, only really six months. It's in interesting, Nori. Have you noticed that? Quite a, sorry, just to move things a wee bit left field, but. There's quite a lot of um, blame for Brexit already being apportioned to the Red Wall. Voters there. It's their fault for Brexit. Um, no mention in the fact that huge swathes of the south of England, that's where Brexit won their vote. So oh, yeah. That was a very important thing. It's an interesting wee move that they're starting to look at this Red Wall as if they can blame it for a couple of things come January. No, I, I, that's a very good point, Jimmy, because even immediately after the vote, um, it might be Danny Dorling, the professor of, I think he's sociology at Oxford University, and he uh, analysed where the votes came for, from for Brexit. And people forget just how many people live in the south of England, south of Birmingham. Aye, I, I mean, when, when you look at if we're, where UKIP were winning their support, it was down the south coast where people are absolutely obsessed with immigration. Hopefully it won't make any difference to us shortly. Mm. Well, be, yeah. you, want to, you want to try and drive from Bristol to Cambridge and find out just how many, you know, how many urban, how much, how little countryside there is left in the south of England. We don't appreciate it if you, if you don't go down and drive around in it. Mm. Aye, that's a... You're right, aye. Greater, Greater London stretches an awful long way towards Wales these days. And the number of people, it's when people get on, uh, if you've got a train from Edinburgh to London, and if it stops in Birmingham or near Birmingham, Birmingham at the National or Milton Keynes, people get on to go to, to, go to work. They're commuting. Why, why would you ever get a train that went that way? <laughs> Sorry, aye. just in a practical sense. Aye. Okay, guys, um, I think we've kind of done that to death. Mm -hmm. Unless anybody's got anything, any quirky stuff that you maybe picked up? No, okay. but I was... Uh, sorry, Stuart, on you go. No, no, not me. I was just going to see maybe, you know, have we talked about maybe going into things deeper? Why don't we put a request to the listeners and viewers see if they if they have any topics that they want us to go into deeper over the next two or three weeks whilst parliaments are on recess and that 
Yeah. There is, oh, there is one. I posted it to you guys on our little WhatsApp chat the other day. Don't ask me to remember what it was. I'm trying to keep. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what we talked about in the last forty-five minutes. Uh, <laughs> okay, we'll look. We'll look at our WhatsApp record and see what, mm -hmm. what what's there. Well, um, well, we won't announce anything at the moment. Then uh, we're back to the pressers tomorrow, and mm -hmm. I would remind everybody that watches them that it's now twelve fifteen. Um, that she's going to open up the press conferences. We, we, we don't yet know where it will be visible because I looked at the channel projection on Freeview today for 24 hours time and there was no mention of any uh, um, press briefing on, on BBC. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if the BBC stopped showing it. On <clears throat> the main channels, I think they'll keep doing it on BBC Scotland. Aye, they'll no, probably do it on the digital platform and that'll be about it. Aye. 12, 12, 15, damn it, that means I'm going to have to miss Bagpuss. Harumph. Oh dear. Oh hey, dear. I, my favourite, Freaky Bay is mine, you know, my favourite cartoon. I don't watch cartoons, boys, I'm far too serious. Oh, well, You're Bay a cartoonist. I know, but I don't watch cartoons. <laughs> I did, however, watch Rio. A Disney animated film, which I wasn't that impressed with. Mm -hmm. right. Certainly not as good as what are those little yellow pill shaped things called? Minions, is it? The minions? minions? Thoroughly enjoyed the minions because I kind of saw myself having lots of minions you've running got, about. Dude. You've got to wonder if the boy from Pixar seen David Mundell and his laddie running about a garden one day and thought, <laughs> that's where I'm going with this minions idea. I, I that that was I I do enjoy the minions I do enjoy them I think because I don't really understand them. Anyway, that said, thank you Stuart Lockhead, Jimmy Hutton, you I'm Nori Stuart, um, and we'll see you all tomorrow, folks. Thanks for listening. I hope you can stand us for another day, uh, but we should have the presser to talk about. Mm -hmm. Cheers for now, folks. <laughs>